I and also, you said that really resonated with me previously was like prompts of the new templates. And what's really interesting, we just did this acquisition. We were going to wait on the announcement staff. Our director of marketing is on vacation this week. And I was like, hey, by the way, we might actually do it next week. And what he gave everybody, I don't know, I didn't think that much of it. And then what you just said really, I don't know, made me think about it more, which was that instead of giving everybody, here's the social posts that everyone should use, it was, hey, I made these prompts for you and you can mm -hmm. put them into GPT and tell it this and everyone will get their own response and everyone gets a unique organic post yeah. that you can write. And I was like, oh, that's cool. But what you just said thing takes that of anywhere you're using a template for yes. anything, being able to provide somebody with, here's how you should interact with the AI and then it'll give you something that's different for you than anybody else. And I think in some situations, the AI that's cited as a bug, right? Anybody who interacts with it gets something completely different so you have no consistency. But that lack mm -hmm. of consistency actually becomes a huge value prop when you're trying to create kind of unique, not unique, but yep. unique enough at scale. That's that's exactly right. And to have your cake and eat it too, the way that we've developed at least our own product, and I've seen similar efforts in the market is like, what are the non-negotiables, right? When you think about compelling outreach that's on brand, reflective of your value prop, relevant for your buyer, chances are if you have a very strong value proposition and a very strong pain point on how you solve that problem, and it's laddered up to the appropriate persona in terms of the different people that are part of your buying committee at the end of the day, that is enough to feed an AI for the rest of its life, right? Its yeah. belly is full. It knows how to mix and match and reword and rephrase, but never lose the intention of what your message is. And that's how you actually get to have that personalization at scale, which I think many pieces of tech have promised for multiple decades, but you've never actually been able to deliver on it until recently with the advent of AI. And so that's how you preserve and protect the brand, but still allow for flexibility and customization on the output. I talked to a lot of founders and CEOs and people doing kind of these arenas on the show. And I think they're all very excited about it. And they're like, oh, everyone loves it. It's amazing. What do you find when you're thinking about whether you're talking to buyers or thinking about messaging? People are looking at Reggie or maybe AI solutions generally. Yep. What is their hesitation, objection? Like what? where are you focusing your marketing efforts that I think then yep. translates to people in market for these solutions? What are they afraid of, thinking about, skeptical of that you guys are trying to overcome? It's great. And the, the I will say, I think for the better, some of the fear mongering and, and the paranoid paranoia and hysteria has calmed down a little bit because I think a lot more people have actually got to touch, feel, manipulate, massage a lot of these AI solutions. Whereas 12 months ago, it was like, oh my God, it's coming for our jobs. We're, we're going to have to move. I saw a clip of Sam Altman like a day ago that was hysterical where he was just like, he's like, when we release these things, everyone's, oh my God, it's the end of jobs and they're going to take everything and everyone's going to be employed. And he's like, and now everyone complains it's too slow. It <laughs> happened right. really fast. And I think that's a really beautiful observation on technology. Yeah. generally exactly of how right. we've experienced that curve. That's exactly. Actually, interestingly enough, so when I broke down the three chapters, if you will, of Reggie, we had the sequence engine, we had the personalization at point, and now we have these agents. We thought about and knew that the capability was possible with agents back in the sequence days, but we thought that the market wouldn't be ready. We were like, no way will people trust this, relinquish the process, take the human out of the loop to that degree. And then when we got to the middle stage, they were like, can't you just press the button for us? They were yeah, like, no, why do I have to do it? Let's go. Literally. And so we're like, okay, so hypothesis disproven. And I think that is Sam Altman's point, which is once once things start to get socialized, people have very high expectations for performance. And actually that's one of the, whether you call it a challenge, a curiosity, one of the best practices that I try to coach anybody is demonstrating patience with the tech, right? For some reason, humans expect far more accuracy, even if it's a really nascent piece of AI tech than they do a human standard. And so what I have to coach people around is if you don't take the time to really mistake massage those prompts in a way that you love the output 99% of the time, which granted is higher than how much I'm sure you love your human output, yeah. right? But people it's like self-driving. Oh, it crash, AI do it third. crash like all the time. Like a perfect like. example. People have these incredibly high standards. So I really encourage people, if not for their own education, to get really familiar with prompt development and engineering. And what if you move that up here? How does that impact that output every time? And so that's one area that I get lots of curiosities around. I think the second thing that 
I hear most often is there's uncertainty in terms of where to apply these solutions to okay. first. Their content's a dime a dozen now in terms of you can use it for top of funnel, mid funnel, customer engagement, everything in between. And I think some folks are paralyzed by the opportunity. And I often think back to my B2C days, right? You make a bad purchase in B2C, you just return your pants to Amazon or, or right. whatever, right? No harm, no foul. Maybe you lose out on a shipping cost. You make a bad purchase in B2B and people lose their jobs. So the stakes are a lot higher and therefore it's a lot more of an emotional sale. And so people don't want to bet on the wrong horse because then their role could be in jeopardy. And so what I like to tell people is think about the different areas or opportunities in your business that have the lowest risk, but the highest reward potential, right? And that's actually why we started in prospecting. When you think about most B2B organizations have hundreds of thousands of leads in their CRM, their marketing automation platform, marketing has spent good money to acquire those folks. And maybe only a sliver is ever engaged with by sales. Sales cherry picks off the folks they think they're going to get the quickest wins with. And everybody else is in this graveyard. And so if you think about Sorry, deploying our this- are trash. I hate them. That's yeah. right. If you think about deploying these agents against greenfield, untouched, never engaged, or worse, just like spam cannon parts yeah. of your database, there's very little risk that something will go terribly wrong and a tremendous upside when you think about all the engagement and pipeline you can actually start to build when you start to shake the gold pan a little bit. So that's my recommendation when people are like, I don't know where to start. Go to the place that's lowest risk, potentially highest reward in your business and test and iterate often. That resonates with me so much because I think we, we're like a big HubSpot co-seller. So we talked to all these people in CRM decisions and everybody's, do you have the AI stuff? And they're like, yeah, we have the AI stuff. And they're like, oh, that's really good. We were told that the AI stuff is really important. And I get asked by analysts and all these people all the time of, oh, is the AI functionality like moving the needle? Is it doing it? I'm like, look, it comes up in every conversation, but no one knows what they want to do with it. And no mm -hmm. one knows where to start. And then when you give them the ability to execute on some of that, they're totally paralyzed and have no idea what they should do with this. They're like, ah, oh, this really freaks me out. I'll do nothing. And I really like yep. the framework of there are lots of areas in your business, in your strategy that are low risk, and potentially high yield. And you might as well throw something at that and see what comes out the other side versus putting it into some existing function. And there's a lot of downside if it goes awry. That's totally right. And maybe you have all these website visitors and you don't have any way to, to engage that audience on web. Think about all these different pockets of where you're like, man, we either do nothing today or we potentially provide a very bad experience today that we'd love to improve. And those are the natural places in which you should test and test often with AI. Mm -hmm.